from Gotham Cara. I um, have been in the high-tech space for a number of years at Seagate Technology, IBM, Hitachi, and some other great companies. It's been vast. It's been from the beginning, over 20 years. Before we called it AI, when I started at IBM about 20 years ago, it's a funny story, I, was, I interviewed for Job X, I showed up on my first day of work and they gave me Job Y. So here I was a subject matter expert in my field of science and engineering and I was thrown into, today we would really call that role kind of a data scientist. So we started our journey, IBM was forward thinking in those days and so we started our journey then and I was in a product engineering kind of group but we had that vision for data assets and algorithms and how do we leverage all of that to get insights and improve our product. And um, it's, it's just grown over the years and as the industries have started and all the buzzwords and so on, we've, we've been right there along the way. It was very exciting. Um, I had a lot of hand pains from the coding <laughs> and so after about three years I said I don't want to do this anymore and I went back into other engineering stuff but then came back to it because I saw how powerful it was. When you have access to all of the data in whatever your product line is or your company is, you really can, can see the full business view, get insights, help teams. So it was, it was very exciting. I think the most fulfilling part of the job for me personally is being able to evangelize the opportunities and to actually work with teams and get results. Being able to lead hundreds of engineers across the globe through our multiple business units and the different companies I've worked for, right, to, to really realize value. And that's not just a, a trite business phrase, but it's really, really energizing teams and getting people to realize that, hey, this algorithm, this scheme, this thought process can really help us get a faster time to decision, uh, improve our product quality, our yield, et cetera, et cetera, help our customers in the end. I think, you know, in, in the space I've been working, I mentioned the, some of the companies I've worked for. This is high-tech hardware device manufacturing and R&D. It's not a Google or a Facebook or, or uh, an AI company in that sense. But we amass massive, uh, huge, enormous amounts of data as we're building our product and during our R&D phases. And so how do we get insights from very complex data, from how do we get learning faster? Um, so we've used AI, um, what we call today AI, these advanced algorithms, advanced analytics in, in numerous cases. From an R&D side, if I'm running a matrix of experiments and I have all of this data, how do I get my arms around it? There are algorithms, unsupervised classification, things that are beyond the typical statistical analysis, regression analysis that engineers do, that by applying those, we can really start to get our hands around these complex problems and start to understand the systems, the physical systems from an R&D perspective. I, I've read interesting articles, academic research at UC Berkeley, at, at many other universities where scholars are looking at new devices, new materials, and they're using machine learning um, algorithms to actually just understand all of this data that they have to help them get insights and classification. So that's on an R&D side. Then on a production side, sure, getting better prediction is kind of the buzzword, but, but even more important than that, I've, I've, I've experienced multiple examples and seen examples of kind of the outlier detection, anomaly detection. How do we find the needle in the haystack that's a quality problem or a reliability problem that's a pain point for our, not only our internal quality teams, but for our, our customer, right? So all kinds of, of applications there. So in my experience, we started with a couple narrow examples, actually, and we found that those narrow examples, it was a surprise 
they became archetypes or prototypes in, that we could leverage across the corporation, multiple business units to attack other kinds of problems. And we found that by doing these one or two narrow use cases, they inspired ideas for others. So in that sense, I don't mind if it's narrow at first, right? Because get a success and then open your eyes to how it can grow. Yeah, so my, my experience has been predominantly in, in hardware-based spaces, right, for the past 20 years or so. And I just see us as an orchard with all this fruit that's ripe on these trees and we just need to keep, it's, you know, low-hanging fruit has been harvested, but we need to get the higher-hanging fruit. And this whole AI aspect into our product development and to our factories and so on, is allowing us to, to grab some of that. So certainly, definitely, in, in my arena, in that hardware arena, I see it. I hear from other colleagues in other spaces um, how they're using things in retail and, and in many other spaces. And, and I think the common literature talks about those things, and I, I really believe them. I don't think there's any industry that, that um, can say, oh, I can't benefit from these advanced analytics or AI. If there's any kind of analysis being done, then this can surely help, right? It's a matter of having that open mind and, and being able to just jump in and try it. I have applications that are saving in the X millions of dollars, right? I mean, if I can improve the product yield by 1%, that's a very high value proposition for a company that's building, you know, millions of widgets per day, right? From a pure ROI standpoint, it's a no-brainer to me. Um, but one still has to demonstrate it and get the buy-in, right, of the execs. But then there are many other use cases which give enormous um, value, I think, but they're not in that quantitative realm. They're, they're solving customer pain points, quality, reliability. We can't just quantify, okay, this is what your, your ROI is, but we can say you've made your customer happy and that's going to translate into a better relationship and continued business. In the hardware space uh, in which I work, I, I work with um, some of the quality teams that are customer facing, and they will get some products that failed. They'll, they'll get a return, and the customer will say, what the heck happened here? We will use AI to look at all of the data on that device to help us understand, to classify what happened, and to help us understand. And, you know, all these high-tech devices are complicated beasts. And, you know, standard, some algorithms give maybe 50% accuracy. Well, that's, that's a coin toss, right? That's not, that's not good enough. So, so we've developed um, other algorithms. We've taken benefit of the rapid advancement of this whole arena um, to bring in the newer algorithms and schemes and so on to improve our accuracies up, you know, significantly. And that delights the customers. We can tell them, okay, we're very sorry this product didn't work. In an hour of analysis, we can turn it around and say, we think this was the cause and this is how we're going to fix it. And then, you know, in a few days, the customer is quite satisfied. Yeah, I've had, I think, two different approaches. <laughs> There are some executives who are very innovative and savvy in this whole area. So if I speak with them about some AI technology, they're already there. They, they're, they understand enough about the space for whatever reason, or they're simply more innovative and they're more of a thought leader, right? And, and for those executives, it's been very easy. Then there are the other executives who aren't in that thought leadership realm. Their expertise is maybe more business leadership or personal people leadership, right? So for them, I've had success by being very straightforward and more bottom line business. Here's what I did. Here's the result I got. Here's how long it took. Big benefit there. Here's how much it's going to cost to move forward, right? And the those simple 
plain, matter-of-fact business statements make a difference to them. And if the AI is really helping, then it'll just sing and it will sing to them. And so I've had to speak to two different audiences, basically. Those that are the thought leaders that are into this, and for them, it's a pretty easy sell. For the other um, executives, um, there's a little bit of nervousness at first, but no, if you've got a solid case, the, the numbers, the, the approach will just sing. I think the misconceptions are numerous at this point. There's still so much hype over, over the AI space. What's a neural network? What's a convolutional neural network? What are these different algorithms and so on, right? So a neural network has nothing to do with the brain. It has nothing to do with neurons. It's just a simple paradigm. The equations behind it actually are not that hard. Um, anyone who's had a reasonable background in statistics or took some math in college can hear a lecture about it with a good lecturer and can say, okay, I get the gist of this and that's good enough, right? And then just let that kind of untouchable, this is untouchable stuff, no, I can't deal with this, just let that melt away. It's, it's, actually, it's actually pretty approachable. Some years ago, I used to hear some executives say, no, these projects, the AI stuff, your machine learning algorithm, neural network, no, that's not going to help us here. What are you talking about? But look, <laughs> it did, and we continue to accelerate our application of that. So it's not well explained, and maybe how, that's how this course will, will help really business leaders understand that. Deep learning is definitely not the only tool out there. That that whole the whole neural network, deep learning, machine learning kind of thing is is um, part of the hype. There are there are many other techniques that are out there. Um, I I think um, people should have a well-rounded, a complete AI or data science toolkit. If you really want to enable your subject matter experts, your engineers, or your data scientists, make sure that you provide them with that. Um, it's not just about making sure they know what deep learning is. Deep learning is not the solution to everything. It may be overkill um, for a lot of things. Yeah, I think in a general sense, what, what I've seen is your data scientists, your engineers, your subject matter experts will have tons of ideas and they'll come up with great things that can and should be implemented. But then the question is, does your corporate architecture support that? Well, does your IT organization's data infrastructure and however you're doing things on premises and a cloud, all of that stuff, does it support the deployment of, of your machine learning, your AI algorithm and scheme? Now, doing things in an R&D mode and kind of ad hoc is easy, but if you really want to go into production with something, then that whole piece, that whole architecture thing, your um, IT organization or whoever is responsible really needs to be in step with, with what the different business units, what the users really need. From what I've experienced and what I've seen is that it's, I don't like this term, but it's a journey. And um, everyone's been learning as they've been going. And architectures have had to change. Companies have invested in whatever architecture it was. They've built a big data lake or something in a, in a, in a cloud, whether it's their cloud or an Amazon cloud or someone else's cloud. And as the use cases and, and algorithms and needs have changed in the company, um, or have they've, as the journeys continue, they've matured, then we realized, oh, we really didn't build the right architecture, and so we really need to move to this, right? And at the same time, the whole architecture arena is, is changing. Um, so IT organizations have to keep up with that, right, and, and ha really have a good AI ops, ML ops kind of structure in place. Now that we have these great tools available to us, right, it's not just traditional statistical analysis, it's the AI world, right, then what do we do with that in terms of our systems and our processes, right? So we should think about 
making sure that as we go through our R&D processes, our factory building, um, our widgets through the factory, that, that, we're in, that we're always asking, okay, whatever the question is we're asking, we should ask the teams, okay, have you used your full toolkit to attack this question, to attack this problem? Was there any additional insight from an AI algorithm or a machine learning algorithm or any better prediction that those can give? So um, we really need to just, I think, ingrain it in our processes from the R&D through the product life cycle into the factory. Whatever we're doing in, in business where there's a problem statement, right? And, and how do we approach that problem statement? And if, if there is some AI application, if there is some data science-y thing to do that will help address that problem, it just needs to be part of the decision flow and that aspect of it needs to be funded. I think as, as more and more wins happen and as people just start accepting this as the new way of doing, it's just additional math and engineering, right? And it's giving value, so just make sure it's, it's funded and it's in the process. Before businesses invest in AI, they should have a party. They should be happy that they're taking this journey and they should do it wisely and they should do it with an IT organization and a factory organization and a quality organization and an engineering organization and an R&D organization and a finance organization all in line that this is the right direction to go and we're going to support it and fund it. The greatest benefit of AI is empowering your people, which leads to tremendous value across the product chain bottom line. It really just needs to be ingrained in all of the processes.